Welcome everyone to another Space News Rundown with me. We're going to talk all things SpaceX Starship as well as take a look at all the launch successes and launch failures that we saw take place over the last few days as well as get ready to watch all of the exciting launches expected over the next few days. So let's waste no more time in getting the video started. Let's begin with Starship updates. To catch anyone up who missed last week's episode, we saw Starship Booster 4 and Ship 20 not only rolled out to the launch site, but also fully stacked to become the world's largest rocket ever, finally dethroning the Saturn V. Of course, the Saturn V can still cling to the title of world's largest rocket ever launched, since this stack here was only a fit test of the two vehicles, and not long after this picture was taken, Ship 20 was lowered back down to the ground and rolled back to the construction site. And on Tuesday the 10th of August, Booster 4 was removed from the launch pad and moved back to the high bay. Both vehicles, now that it's been confirmed that they all fit together, will now be entering the final stages of construction ahead of the first Starship orbital launch. Launch. Both vehicles have had their Raptor engines removed, which for any other space program would represent a months long delay to allow them to be refitted, but of course this won't really put any kind of dent in the Starship timeline, as I'm sure you remember SpaceX installed all 29 of Booster 4's Raptors in a single night. Now Booster 4 and Ship 20 represent the first and second stages of the Starship vehicle, but for a little while now we've known that Elon refers to the launch site, this being the tower, launch table and all ground support equipment as Stage Zero, which in fact represents a far greater engineering challenge than the rocket itself is, if you can believe it. Probably the most massive engineering challenge that needs to be overcome for Stage Zero is Mechazilla, the name given to the two gigantic arms that'll be fitted to the launch tower that'll not only catch the first stage booster, but also the Starship vehicle itself, as Elon confirmed on Twitter. People have speculated for a little while now what the Starship's landing legs will look like, the ones we've seen on SN5 to 15 were only temporary and they were single use legs and they had to be replaced after each use. Not that any of these vehicles ever flew again, unless you want to count Ship 10. <laughs> well, landing legs are heavy. Elon has stated that he estimates that an empty Starship weighs between 160 and 200 tons, so it would require some pretty substantial, and as such very heavy, legs to support this mass. So it makes sense that SpaceX, given that they already planned to catch the first stage with the tower, will be attempting to catch the Starship too. Starship will of course eventually need landing legs for Moon and Mars missions, but we're quite a long way off from those just yet. What's not a long way off though is the Starship orbital flight. Elon confirmed yesterday that the first orbital stack of Starship should be ready for flight in just a few weeks, pending only regulatory approval, and then confirmed that this is a real-time estimate and not an Elon time estimate. <laughs> On Friday, we saw Ship 20 rolled back out to the launch site, presumably so that it can begin its testing campaign, you know, your pressure, cryo and static fire testing that we've all come to know and love in the Starship program so far. Now, in all of these pictures of Booster 4 and Ship 20, there is another Starship prototype in sight, Booster 3. This was never destined to fly, but it's been sitting at the pad for quite a while now after it completed its three-engine static fire test a few weeks back. Well, it looks like now its fate is sealed. We can assume it's now in the process of scrapping after we saw it get cut into two halves on Saturday. We might see more chopping up on site before it's all hauled away, but this looks like curtains for the first real prototype Super Heavy. All of that aside, last week we also had the absolute bombshell of Everyday Astronaut's third and final episode of his amazing Elon Musk interview. I would highly recommend you watch all three of these videos via the on-screen link or via the link in the description, but some of the biggest things that we learned from this amazing mini-series included the news that the Super Heavy booster grid fins will in fact never fold in, like they do on Falcon 9. There was some mild speculation that perhaps Booster 4's fins won't be able to fold because it's only a prototype, but Elon informed us all that as long as the grid fins follow the flow of the airstream, they won't really cause any disturbance or significant drag. On the subject of the grid fins, we also now know that they won't be the pieces that'll take the weight of the booster upon catching. This will instead be handled by these two small pylons, which are load-bearing points for picking up the booster. We also learned that 
stage separation will work very similarly to the Falcon 9 Starlink staging, in that the separation of the booster and ship will be achieved by rotating the stack right before engine cutoff. This rotation will result in a difference in inertia between the two stages, causing a natural separation. The rotation and control of the booster will be achieved by both the main engines and the cold thrust reaction control system. On Starship though, there is a lot of ullage gas. This is the hot gaseous oxygen and methane that builds up inside the tanks. This is usually vented off to the side, but SpaceX are considering moving these vents to a position that would allow them to use the venting of the ullage gas as a means of useful control, negating the need for cold or hot gas reaction control systems. Later on in the interview series, we caught a glimpse inside the Raptor tent and learned some juicy gossip about the Raptor version 2, which is currently in development at SpaceX. The Raptors that we've all come to know and love look great and all, but there's no denying that this mess of plumbing and wiring looks a bit of a spaghetti headache. Elon confirmed that the Raptor version 2 is visibly much cleaner and pointed out that this naked Raptor over here looks very similar to how version 2 will look. Perhaps with even further iterations of Raptor, SpaceX will get it looking as clean as Falcon 9's beautiful Merlin engines. Anyway, if Elon's estimation of two weeks after SpaceX knock out their four priorities of adding the remaining TPS tiles to Ship 20, install the thermal protection for the booster engines, complete the ground propellant tanks and finish the quick disconnect arm for the ship, then I think very soon we'll be seeing some very amazing things down at the Boca Chica coastline. So make sure you're subscribed to my channel to keep up to date on all stuff Starship. I make these videos every single Monday to keep you in the know. Anyway, with all that said and done, let's wrap up Starship coverage for the week there and take a peek at what else took place last week. Last week, we had a couple of launches. The first was on the 10th of August, and this was the Cygnus NG-16 launch to the International Space Station, which as usual launched on an Antares 230 Plus rocket from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport. The cargo spacecraft carried about a thousand kilograms of new science experiments, including a muscle study and 3D printing investigation, to the International Space Station. The spacecraft will remain attached to the station for about three months before being re-released to enter the atmosphere and be destroyed. The next launch of the week was from India, and I've had to modify the footage a little bit here to avoid getting a copyright claim from the Indian government, so forgive me for that, but this was a geosynchronous satellite Mark II launch vehicle, which was supposed to take a single Earth observation satellite into, as the rocket's name would imply, geosynchronous Earth orbit. But sadly, the launch suffered a failure during third stage ignition, and as such, the entire endeavor was effectively just a very expensive firework. Hopefully, the ISRO can figure out what the cause of failure was, and take the the necessary steps to prevent it from happening again. Anyway, those were the only two rocket launches that we saw last week. We did see a few deep space events. There were two Venus flybys, one by the Solar Orbiter and one by the Bepi Colombo probe, and we also saw the ninth perihelion of the Parker Solar probe. I discussed all three of these events in great depth in last week's Space News, so I'll pop a link on screen and in the description to that, so you can check it out if you want to hear more about these missions. And hey, while you're down there, do consider hitting that like button really does help a tremendous amount in supporting the channel at no cost and helps me to keep making these videos every single week. Moving on, over the past few weeks we've been watching the Boeing Starliner launch attempt which was supposed to happen back at the beginning of August but following the disastrous Nyoka module docking to the International Space Station and then a failure with 13 of the Starliner's valves, the launch was delayed indefinitely. In a statement last week, Boeing have declared that they've managed to recover all but four of the 13 valves that failed to properly open during the pre-flight test, but after doing everything they could on those, they eventually realized that they would need to go back to the factory with it, and as such, de-stacked Starliner from the Atlas V rocket and returned the capsule to the factory for deeper level troubleshooting. This new setback for Boeing means that we now may not see the Starliner launch until 2022, due to the busy schedule surrounding space station activities and of course the launch sites themselves. The kicker to all of this is that this isn't even the first time Boeing has seen a frankly embarrassing delay to their commercial crew capsule. Starliner was initially supposed to reach the International Space Station all the way back at the end of 2019, but software issues prevented it from reaching the station. Hopefully this latest flight test won't see any further delays after this one and that we might finally see another commercial capsule that could compete with SpaceX's Crew Dragon. With that though, I'm going to wrap up last week's summary there and moosey along to our final topic, all the launch events this week. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I've got two days for you to mark in your diaries this week, the 17th and the 19th of August. The first launch of the week will be an Ariane Space Vega rocket, which will be taking flight in the early hours of the 17th. As usual, the Vega will launch from the French Guiana Space Center in South America, and its primary payload will be the Pleiades Neo 4, a European Earth observation satellite by Airbus Defense and Space. In addition to the primary payload, the rocket will also carry four CubeSats, a French Signals Intelligence CubeSat, an Italian Education CubeSat from the University of Rome, a Hungarian Space Weather CubeSat, and finally a Finnish CubeSat also designed for space weather monitoring. The next launch will be on the same day as Vega, a little bit later on in the day. This will be a Long March 2C, taking flight from the Huiquan launch site in China, which will carry two communication satellites into low Earth orbit. The final launch of the week will be on the 19th of August, and this will be a Soyuz 2.1, taking flight from the Baikonur Cosmodrome with the next 34 OneWeb communication satellites on board. While OneWeb has got a bit of catching up to Starlink to do, it's nonetheless making steady progress. This launch will take its in-orbit mega constellation to 288 satellites, making OneWeb the second largest satellite fleet in orbit. Anyway, that's a wrap on the key dates for this week, which means we can now wrap up this section of the video there. And that's it for another Space News Rundown with yours truly. I do hope you enjoyed it, and hey, if you did, then please don't forget to hit that like button. It really does an unbelievable amount of good to help support what I do here on the channel. And hey, if you'd like to go that one step further, you can consider joining the channel by clicking the button below the video and get yourself a cool badge next to your name and an array of exclusive emojis to use in the comments section. Alternatively, you could do what the fine folk on the left did and join my Patreon page, a link to which is both in the description and on screen. That's not the only thing that's on screen, as you may have noticed. There are two video suggestions. One is a video chosen for you by YouTube's recommendation algorithm that thinks you'll like. Hopefully it was a good pick. And the other one is my most recent Kerbal video, which, if you're watching this on day of upload, should be my recreation of the ESA space plane. Anyway, that's everything. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.